Hi everyone, I am Sanya Kule, I'm the teaching assistant for um, the advanced bioinformatics class at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So today I want to talk about um, how we can use the Dirichlet distribution to improve a probability weighted matrices that we get. So here what you're going to see is that we have these DNA sequence logo motifs and um, what we usually have is um, the amount of, um, you know, like the different bases here represent the different positions along um, the DNA sequence. And the higher the position, that means that the more certain we are about the DNA base uh, being that um, particular um, value. So here it's a C, so we definitely show it's a C here. And then this is also a G, which is at the same height as well. Anytime we're not so sure and it's, and it's, equal, and it's divided among three bases, the height diminishes. And when it's for all four bases, the height is even smaller. So you can see here the height for like three bases, you know, if it's equally distributed among three, it's kind of, you know, smaller than if we know that hey, A has a higher probability of it being A than T or G, then it has a higher amount of information content. So it's sort of telling us the information content that there is. And it's based upon each location in the motif about how probable it is to be a certain location. Like if we definitely know that this is a G or a C, it's like very high because we know what we expect for that location, in that position. And like here, if we know it could be a C, O, and A, you know, out of the four DNA bases, then that's still a lot higher than knowing that it could be among three DNA bases. So this is all sort of built off of a probability weighted matrix. And this is really important because, um, so sort of just a little bit of a review about why this is important and a little bit of the biology behind this. Well, in DNA, we have um, the DNA bases of adenine, guanine, cytosine and thymine here. So we have these four um, different DNA bases. And you see here for hydrogen bonds, adenine binds with thymine, cytosine binds with guanine, um, again over here as well. So we have these two groups of DNA bases, the four DNA nucleotides, A, C, G, and T they can be partitioned into two subsets of chemically similar nucleotides. The purines, you know, adenine and guanine here, and the pyrimidines, which are cytosine, thymine, and uracil. So in case your head was exploding, what I think that, um, you know, like SpongeBob, what is it, what is it? So I think what really is important is to um, see that in case you forget what are purines and pyrimidines, um, there's some different mnemonics that you can use out there. Like, you know, purines, you know, pure as gold, adenine and guanine are purines. And, um, you know, like all that is good is pure adenine, guanine and purines. Or we also have C, the pyramids, cytosine, thymine, pyrimidines. So these are some mnemonic devices. Or in the pyramid, you see tombs. So you can have uracil, cytosine, and thymine again, or you can do cut the pie, you know, cytosine, uracil, and thymine. So uracil is actually an RNA, and it, it's sort of in, in place of thymine. And it's Squidward and SpongeBob. So there are a bunch of different mnemonics that you can use to sort of identify um, what are the um, different, um, you know, groups. And these are groups of chemically similar subsets um, in the DNA slash RNA. So if this was RNA, you'd have cytosine and uracil. Um, but in the DNA, it's cytosine and thymine that are the pyrimidines. And then the purines, again, are adenine and guanine. So a little bit about like gene regulation. So there are transcription factors and they help regulate the expression of genes, the activation or the repression of various genes. So you see here that these are transcription factors and um, when they bind to these regulatory elements like enhancers or promoters, they help recruit these other um, you know, proteins as well. And that ends up bringing RNA polymerase here to the site of the promoter. And that leads to the transcription of the gene. So the transcription factors, you know, it has like sequence specific motifs that it binds to 
like you see this T binds with this A, so it's kind of, you know, not so clear. A binds with the T, C with the G, G with the C, and it's very sequence specific, the transcription factor binding site. So transcription factors are known as TX. So um, it just, you can think of it like puzzle pieces. And along the DNA, you have the site. And when it binds there, it helps with the regulation of a key regulated gene. Um, so along here again, you know, where the transcription factors are binding, they bind to these motifs. And um, this is sort of where it is along the DNA. And you can think of it, for example, like if we look at this, um, you know, this is an HLH motif along the DNA, you can figure out that, okay, this is where it binds. You know, it has this sequence-specific motif that it binds to along the DNA. And again, this is another example where we have HTH motif, another transcription factor. And we're just trying to figure out, okay, well, where does it bind along the DNA? Like, what does that motif look like? Where is it likely to bind? So, Oftentimes, we have a bunch of sequences, and we need to figure out, okay, well, where would they bind to in the DNA? So, for instance, we'll have the Homer algorithm or the meme algorithm, expectation maximization, which we've learned about. And these sort of tell us, like, okay, well, um, what do we predict is the probability weighted matrix? What does the motif look like in these locations? And again, there are other tools that look at chip seeks. That's chromatin immunoprecipitation experiments for given transcription factors. And we're trying to figure out, like, you know, the sequence specific motifs and where, um, you know, the transcription factors will bind, um, you know, along here as well. And again, these are other ways that we're looking at. Okay, well, maybe let's look at this um, transcription factor, HOXB13, and look at its motif here as well. And again, these are other transcription factors, HSF1, heat shot factor, you know, LEEU3, SIP4, RDS1, and these are binding sites. And we can use Gibbs sampling and, um, you know, best motif score or manual with choice. And again, I have some videos, a little bit about Gibbs sampling in case you're interested, so please check those out. So we have these four DNA nucleotides, A, C, G, and T. We can partition them into two subsets of chemically similar nucleotides, purines A and G and pyrimidines C and T. And again, um, what you'll see is in RNA, this T is replaced with a U. This becomes a U in RNA. So the way that it works is we look at these transcription factor binding sites and we have this position weight matrix. And then from this position ma weight matrix, you know, we have these frequencies, we get these probabilities. So we first get used to counts of all the bases and locations. Then we get the frequency information, like what is the predicted probability? Um, you know, like this is saying, for instance, that, hey, in the first location, it's a 100% probability of us having an A. Then in the second location of the motif, 60% probability that the base is a C and then 40% of it being a G. So it's split between a C and a G. And then it looks like in the third position of this motif, 90% of the time we observe a G, 10% of the time we observe a T. And then lastly, um, so we would define two bases here. And lastly, in the fourth and last position of this motif, 80% of the time we would find a T and 20% of the time we find an A. So the fewer bases that there are that are possible in the probability weight matrix, and the higher the probability, like if one has more of a majority than the others, we have more information. Like if I were to tell you that, um, you know, you have a 50-50 chance of winning, or maybe my algorithm is saying that you have a 55% chance, chance of winning and a 45% chance of not winning some competition, for instance, you would not really be so confident. It's, it's almost like a coin flip, you know, it's not as great, sadly. So in the probability weight matrix, um, which is what we talked about in the previous slide as well, and um, that's what a PWM is, we look at the probability of observing base C at position K. So in DNA, it can be base C can be A, G, C, or T, adenine, guanine, thymine, cytosine. And if we were looking at um, RNA, it would be adenine, um, uracil instead of thymine, guanine, and cytosine. So we have zero um, if it's the background, if it's not a motif. And when K is greater than zero, but less than W, W is the number of bases um, in the motif. Um, so we can have up to, like, let's say we have, like in the previous slide, there was four bases in our motif. 
then W would be 4. And if K is 0, we're looking at the background. Otherwise, K 1, 2, 3, or 4 represents the positions in the motif. So what we talked about is in the expectation maximization and Gibbs approach, we usually set these pseudo counts to being equal to one each. So um, in the end, what happens is in the um, DNA or RNA case, the way that this looks is that, you know, you have this as one. And then you also have this as one. And for these four bases, you know, so again, base B can be like A. A, C, G, or T. So it can be these four bases. So let me actually just make this a little bit clearer. That's a G. Sorry, that's a G. A, C, G, or T. So, and um, what we were like, okay, th these are the pseudo counts. But one of the things that we realize is that, you know, um, like we can definitely set some um, pseudo counts usually, you know, because there's some bases that could be very common in certain residues, or there can be some bases that are not as common that we know about. So what these pseudo counts are doing is that they're like um, saying that we don't want any base to have a zero probability of being there, like in a specific location C, like, you know, um, a specific location um, K, we want each base, you know, A, C, G, T, to have at least some non-zero probability. Like, even if it's very small, we don't think there's a zero percent chance for it to be any of the bases. It should be any some small little number. So that's why we use pseudo counts as a form of Laplace smoothing. So that's what this is doing. So we usually set the pseudo counts to one in expectation maximization and Gibbs approach. But what if we don't want to set this to one? What if we want to use prior information that we know about these pseudo counts? How can we accommodate this prior information? So that's what you know we're thinking about it. You know, how, how can we um, set the pseudo counts to some value besides just one? Can we use a data-driven approach or something about biology to figure this out? You know, we're thinking, like, what if we just don't want to set these to one? That's where we look up upon the Dirichlet distribution. You know, it's a family of continuous multivariate probability distributions parameterized by a vector alpha of positive reals. You know, it's a generalization of the beta distribution. And over here, we see like, the probability um, density function. And we notice that there's like this giant like hangman kind of sign, like the hangman. And what that represents is it's a gamma function. And for all positive integers, you know, if you plug in a number, it's equal to that number minus one exclamation point where this is a factorial. So we're going to use the Dirichlet distribution, which is a very powerful distribution. And again, um, what we find again is we can look at the probability of component k and it's proportional to nk in this gamma function for the numerator and then for the denominator as well. And if we were looking here, um, you know, in for amino acids, we, uh, for instance, we can co we can find component likelihoods using Dirichlet distributions. So we're trying to get to the top of figuring out how we can do this, right? And just as a little reminder, again, this is Bayes' rule. And what Bayes' rule, for instance, is saying the probability of B given A is a probability that event B will occur given that event A has occurred. And where this comes into place is over here. Oh, gosh. This thing here is what this is. That's Bayes' rule. So if we want to find the probability that A occurred given that B occurred, we take the probability that B occurred given that A occurred and we multiply it by the probability that of A occurring divided by the probability of B occurring. And what this numerator is also known as is the probability of, um, actually let me write it in full. So this numerator is the probability of A and B. That's what this is, probability of A and B. That's what the numerator is. That's what this whole giant term is representing. 
right here. This thing right here is probability of A and B. And for factorials, you know, when you have 1 to the exclamation point is equal to 1. And also one other thing is that 0 to uh, exclamation point is also 1 just for, you know, 0 exclamation point, 0 factorial is also equal to 1. That's an exclamation point. So um, these are uh, for, for a factorial, you just multiply it by itself and by every single number that is less than it, you know, like every single integer that is a positive integer that is less than it. So that's how you understand factorial. So 5 factorial is 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. So what we want to do is we want to incorporate information about purines and pyrimidines. You know, we want to get better parameter estimates for our probability weight matrix from a Dirichlet prior distribution. So we want to incorporate it into our standard PWM model by using a Dirichlet mixture prior with two components. So we want to get this improved and even better probability weight matrix that represents something about biology, because these probability weight matrices are what we use to derive our sequence specific motifs, where we predict like the transcription factors could be binding um, and what those motifs looks like. So we want to use one component for the purines and the second for pyrimidines. So for, for the purines, adenine and guanine, and for the pyrimidines, which are cytosine and, and thymine. And again, in that probability weight matrix, for instance, if you have a width of three, zero represents the background, always for anything is the background. And then you have k equals one, two, and three if you have a width of three. Or if you have a width of 4, you have k equals 1, 2, 3, and 4, and k tells the position you are in in the motif. And like this p of a comma 3 is a probability that we have an a in the third position of the motif. And here, similarly, that, that represents the same thing here, but we also have another location, the fourth location, because our motifs are like four bases long. And here, they're just three bases long, so it could be like a, t, c, for instance, and then this could be like a, t, c, g or ATCC, for instance. And this is, we want to get even better um, parameter estimates here. So again, we can set these um, pseudo counts using a mixture of Dirichlet's, and this is what the pseudo counts are known as. Um, so for each character, C um, can be A, C, G, T, and a given location within the motif. If it's zero, it's a background. We can use this mixture of Dirichlet where alpha to the J is the Jth Dirichlet component. We don't need to know which Dirichlet to pick. We can use the observed counts to decide how much to weight each Dirichlet. So here, if this is the alpha one component here, alpha to the one power. And then this is the alpha two, this is the second component, and we have each of the counts for these different bases here. Um, and this is what we have the first component focusing on the purines and the second component focusing on the pyrimidines here. So due to uniform probabilities of each Dirichlet component, please note that the probability that m equals one is the probability that m equals two is one half. So we have an equal probability of observing both of these of these um, components here. So that's what we observe over here, alpha one and alpha two over here. So this tells you the counts of, um, you know, in each of these components. So the way this works again is that this is pretty much just mapping to this. And similarly, this T of two is just this right here. That's how you can think of it. You just plug in all these values. So this is your, this whole thing here. This whole thing here is just your, this whole thing is just your alpha one. This is just a one, sorry, it looks a little bit messy, but this is just an alpha one. So now we talked about this issue again, like, you know, we talked about the probability weighted matrix, the probability of observing base C at position K. For K equals zero, it's the background non-motif positions, and this represents the position in the motif where W is the width of the motif. And these are the pseudo counts, and we usually set them to one in the EM and Gibbs approach. And the answer to our problem, like, can we set these to better answers, you know, but better than just one? 
well, we can use a mixture of Dirich Lays to set the pseudo counts. And then this is what it will look like because we have two components, one for the purines and one for the pyrimidines. And we're going to use this information, this alpha C information that we have, this prior information. So the old method, again, is that we are having this old probability weighted matrix, and then we usually have this, you know, set to be equal to one here. And then we usually have this set equal to one. But we're going to improve our probability weighted matrix using prior information. So it's going to look just like this. This is the new information that we want. And we're going to set our pseudo counts using this formula over here. So where you see um, that we have this DC, DK comma C and DK comma C, we're going to actually plug this in here. So we're going to take this old approach here and we're going to plug this formula in over here and over here as well for the pseudo counts. And then what we're going to do is we're going to then get this updated free probability weighted matrix in return. So you can see here, M equals one, um, let me bring my highlighter out again, my laser. So K comma C is equal to this probability plus this probability. This is the, the component of the Dirichlet. And I'm just bringing this part in here. So that's what we observe here, that this part is, is just this part over here. That's what that part is, the pseudo count. And at the bottom, we're also going to plug it in here too, using these updated values, using that formula. So this is how we have our improved probability weighted matrix using this prior information that we have, you know, prior biological information. So it shows that biology and statistics and math can go really hand into hand. So we look across all of the DNA sequences, and then we can find out like these counts uh, in each location. Where, for instance, nk comma a is the number of a bases in the background if k equals zero, and um, the, and if it's greater than zero, it will be the number of a bases in position k of the motif. You know, like so, if based on the width, k can go anywhere up from one to the width. So if we have like five bases in our motif, it can be k, it can be one, two, three, four, or five, and then if we have n like three comma A, that would be the number of A bases in position three of the motif. And the same thing here for each of these different bases. So that's how we see it. We look at A, and A, and then we look at the position K. And just a little example, because I'm also very much a visual learner. that if we have these four DNA sequences, we can look at A, C, G, and T, and then get that, okay, we have six. And like, if we look across all four of these sequences, we find that we have four, um, no, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, six, eight. And then we also look here, and then we will find, okay, for T, we have one, two, the second one over here. And we have the last guy, which is this one. So we have three T's out of all of these. But then again, that's how we get those counts. So N, A, C, G, and T. We have to cross all our sequences and then look at those counts. So then this is the next formula that we use. We take these um, alpha A, J, alpha C, J, alpha uh, G, J. We take these and then we define for these two components this formula to define our Z, alpha, J. Um, function of alpha j. And then this is examples where I plug in j equals 1 and then j equals 2 here. It might not make a lot of sense right now, but we will sort of put everything together and then it should make a lot more sense for the after. So, um, so basically now what you also see here is that we have m, n, k. So n, k again, like so for k being any particular position um, in the motif, if um, you know, so again, if k is greater than zero, so for k greater than zero, it's a position um, in the motif. And then if k equals zero, 
it's the background. So it's a position that is um, a non motif position. So what we do here is, is these are the factorial again. And just as a quick reminder, what we talked about again, like if we have like seven factorial, that's the same thing as equal to seven times six times five times four times three times two. And then one is always one, but we can just for, for, um, for this to be complete, we can have times one. So that's how we take like each of these factorials and then we have these set of counts and basically these are in each position along the motif we look at um, these count values here. Okay. So what I um I think what's really cool here is that in this example, like let's say that we have these four DNA sequences, okay, and we know we have a set of motifs. Yes, we think those are great motifs. So like in the first sequence, we think it is A T G T. In the second sequence, we think it's C A G G. Third sequence C C T C, and fourth sequence C A G A. And we currently believe that there are these four motifs that are the best. You know, so these are the four that we believe. So when I was talking about this um, NA1, um, like when we define for given um, NK comma C, when you, when you see this, what this is really um, talking about is the following. So if we have, um, let me write it this way. So when you see anywhere that we have NK comma C, what this is really referring to is just we're looking um, at the kth, kth position. Um, if k is zero, it's background. Um, otherwise, we look here for, for c here. c tells us the um, character that we're looking at. So c can be a, c, g, or t. Um, actually, sorry, I think it looks, um, it should be like this. Actually, sorry, it should look like this. And um, C comma K. It, it, the, the general idea is that uh, one of them is referring to the base and one of them is referring to the position within them. So the letter would be the, um, and so here I wrote it like C comma K. And this would just refer to um, the character A, C, G, or T. And the position within the motif is here one, two, three, or four. That's what this would refer to here. And we're just trying to find the count. So here we see in the first position, we just have one A, we have three Cs, and we have zero Gs or T, so these are zero. Then in the second position here, so again, um, what these would be is that this would be um, position one, two. Oh gosh, Oops. this would be positions two three and then four like that's how we would recommend like this so this a is actually this is position four and then this is three two so then what we see is in position um two we have these two a's here like we have this a over here and we have this a over here as well that's what those would refer to right now um, and that's how we get these values. So we just basically go through all of the motifs and then we figure out, okay, for the Gs, we have three Gs in this location and we have one T here. Then lastly, we have like one T, um, which is why that's one. We have one G, which is why that's one. We have one C and then one A. That's how we get those values. Um, and if we were to look at the background, we would do the same thing and then we would end up getting like, um, so we would look in the background and then that would be for um, like we would have something here and this is the background here. Oh gosh, this is the background. And in the background, what we have is, let me write it like this. We would have like how many A's do we have in the background? Well, we have these, um, we have these two here. We have this one here, so that's three four, 
and 5. So this would be 5 here for the A, for instance. That's a 5. And then we would do the same thing for the others. And the zero represents what this K is. So what we have, for instance, is we would have N um, A comma 0 is equal to 5. So 5 in the background. So I hope that makes sense. So then what we do here is we see that we have uniform probabilities of each Dirichlet component. Um, so what happens is the probability that m equals 1, this is the first component, is equal to m equals 2, is equal to 1 half. And what each of these were, again, um, they were like the, this one was like, one of them was like the pyrimide, uh, pyrimidines and purines. So purine component and then pyrimidine. The short for pyrimidine and pyrimidines are the C comma T and the purines are the A comma G pure as gold. So that's how we can um, see these components. So when we look at this again, um, so going off of Bayes rule, so for Bayes rule, if we have probability of something, probability of B given A will just be equal to the probability of um, a and B, which is just the same thing as A given um, B times the probability of B all the way over the probability of A in base rule. So that's sort of, again, how we derive it like anything. And for probability of A, we need to consider all of the options for that. Um. So here we also can see that for k equals zero for the background non-motif phases, then we can also use Bayes rule again. So probability of having n zero given m j is um, m equals j for Dirichlet component. So we use the z function that we defined earlier. We use this alpha j, we use plus n zero, and then we use this factorial here that we defined earlier. Um, so please make sure you have those handy, but I also have a cheat sheet at the end so that you can refer to everything. And then here, if instead of j, we just plug in j equals one here, then we have the formula for j equals one is over here. And then the formula for j equals two is also given here and then in, as well. And similarly, I'm just showing because definitely motif will have at least one base in the motif. So I'm just showing you for k equals one, what would happen is we would just, um, so let me just highlight this here. So this is for k equals one. So you can see here, this is one. Um, this is also one that we focus on. Um, we focus on this one here. And like those are the main changes that we have. So it's the same formula when we were just kind of adjusting it based on what k is. So I hope that makes sense. Again, so that's like the probability of observing N1 given if we are using a certain Dirichlet component where we could be using the pyrimidine or we could be using the purine based on what our J is. And about, but there could also be more like here right now, we're just trying to improve our probability weighted matrix using some external information that we have about like in biology. Hmm. Like we're trying to use that external information to help make an improvement. Pseudo counts using Dirichlet. So like, you know, Jimmy Neutron, we're gonna also say, hey, look, we can define a customized precise way of having pseudo counts instead of having them all just equal to one. What we can do is we can have the pseudo counts here and um, we can use these probabilities that we just defined, use this AC1 and um, use this AC component two. This is for J equals, um, so what this part is, this first part is, is um, here, this is j equals 1. This part here is j equals 2. And um, what the c is, is the c in all these bases. c equals a, c, g, t. That's what this little mini c is over here. And then for all these k's, so depending on the number of motifs we have, the width w is the number 
of bases in motif. That's what it is. So, what we also see is that k equals zero for the background non-motif positions. So, based on what we had found, we find these probabilities of n zero given m m j. Um, this is what we talked about before, and based on that, we can sort of now define um, the probability of m j given n zero. So, we use these probabilities that we define here. We use Bayes' rule. And then all we do is we just see that to find mj given n0, it's the same thing as taking, like, um, it's, it's basically the numerator and denominator. It's all kind of derived from this formula. That's what the numerator is and then the denominator as well. So that's how we can see that each of these denominator terms and numerator terms are kind of derived from this over here. That's what they're derived as. And once we have that for all the bases, we actually derive what is in the background probability. So that's what this PC0 is. This is the background probability. Then the background, what's the probability that we observe a given base in a non-motif in a background position? So this would be the formula that we would use here. And similarly, I'm just showing for k equals 1, but you would do this for the like k equals 2, 3, however many um, bases you have in your motif. And so for k equals 1, you can see the same thing here. I use this part here. Um, these things just go into the numerator and also in the denominator as well. And then from this formula here, what you notice is that I can just, um, oh, sorry, this should be a one. My bad, this should be a one. This should be a one. Sorry about that. That should be a one. So one comma C and then one over here and then N1 and then AC. So that's what this should be here. So one C, and then you also have it over here as well. And then you have these pseudo counts. Um, and now we're going to kind of talk about like this is sort of how you define the pseudo count. That's what this numerator value is here that we talked about as well. So in the end, what you're going to notice is that we have this customized um, the probability weighted matrix. And um, the way that you see it is that for A0, this is the formula A0, comma A, the same, same thing, as long as you know that one of them is a position and one of them is a base. Then you have this updated pseudo count here, and then you have your denominator. But before, these just used to be one, but now we have a formula to calculate what that is. And then we have the same thing for the probability of us observing a C in um, the background, a non-motif part. And let's assume here that like, if we have a motif that has width three, that three bases inside it, then that's what we find. And then we have the same thing for probability of us observing an A in the third part of the motif, the third position. This is the formula that we use here. And again, for C in all these bases is in the denominator. And then here we also have it for G um, being in the third position of the motif. So all in all, I just want to show you this overall formula that you can use. I think this will be super helpful. This is like Plankton has like a secret formula cheat sheet. So the way to think of this is you have, um, these are the J equals two components for our Dirichlet distribution. And um, it's a mixture of Dirichlet's. So what we have is this first part is the alpha A um, alpha base and was in component one, the alpha, the A base in component two. And that's how each of these is. And then when you take all of these together, this whole, like if we take this as a matrix or something, that that's is what we have as our alpha of one it equals this whole thing. So the J is a number of Dirichlet components. So here it's two. We have uniform probabilities of each component. So this happens 50% of the time and this happens 50. That's what we're assuming. So each of these is 50% of the time. We have these four DNA bases. If this was RNA, then we would change this T to a U. 
And then we also defined these counts and we looked at an example of how we find the total number of bases across all DNA sequences. And similarly, this is the total number of, of, of across um, all the bases, but this is in a position K of the motif if K is greater than zero. So if K is equal to zero, it's the background, it's a non-motif. So this one is non-motif again, and the other one below is a motif position. So what we see here is that we also found this formula here where we take these count values and then we can plug them in to find this M and K, N, K here. Um, and this part, it really comes in handy. Um, this over here comes in handy, especially this part here, because if we look at the denominator for the Dirichlet component, that's what we are using this M function here. And we also define the Z function here which looks the, the following, where we subtract one, and these are factorial signs, so please be careful. These are factorial. This is an exclamation point here, exclamation point, exclamation point. So please make sure that you got down the notes from earlier, where we have um, you know, the, the giant exclamation points. So um, I just sort of will reiterate that, that what this is, is this is a giant exclamation point right here. Um, this is a giant exclamation point, so it's a factorial. And then this part over here, the importance of this is that it will be used inside. This is the Z function here. So after that, so we see that this M function that we have here will be the denominator here. This Z function is going to come in the numerator, and that's what we put this as a function of in the numerator as well. And again, it's also used here. So whatever this is, you sort of put this in here. Then for our probabilities, what we get is we can then get M and K is equal to all of these. And these then are fed in. Like So what these values are is these are used. So this thing, these parts right here, these things right here, they are then used in this formula to then give us this probability value here. And then what this is, is this is then used um, each of these components then is involved in helping generate the probability values. So this is saying the probability that we observe base C in position K, and that's what this whole probability weighted matrix is. It's giving us those probabilities, and we're optimizing our probability weighted matrix. So the, each of these probabilities, we just look at these respective values. So if we want to, for instance, find the probability of G and 1, for instance, we would just... We would plug in C equals G and then K equals 1. And then we would get those values. So this is like a cheat sheet, but these are really the formulas and how they all tie in together. And this is how we optimize our components of this. Of this. Um, so I really hope that this was helpful to you guys. This is a little cheat sheet. So please subscribe to my channel and like my video if you found it was helpful. So my name is Sania Kuller. Again, um, it is. Sania Kuller, and that's my logo. I hope that this was helpful. Please let me know if you have any questions at all. Thank you, guys. And hopefully I did not scare you guys. Hopefully you're not like running away like Squidward, SpongeBob, Patrick. Hopefully I can explain concepts that are also difficult for me to understand in a way that makes sense to you guys as well. So please definitely please reach out to me if you have any questions at all. Thank you guys.